Hi everyone, I'm here to talk to you today about Dino in a talk I call Enter the Dinosaur, the what, why, and how of the Dino.js runtime. So for those of you who don't know, I'm Mark Bennett, a developer and owner of Burma Studios, where I make business software for my clients. You might know me from Dev Edmonton or my other talks here at the meetup. I'm always happy to chat running kids or working in software. And you can find me on Twitter or GitHub at Mark Bennett or at Mark on the DES Slack. So to start off, Node is great. Uh, it fulfills the promise of letting you run JavaScript everywhere, whether that is on the server, the browser, or when you're developing rich clients using things like React Native. And NPM, again, is awesome. It's huge. There's packages for just about everything and uh, the ecosystem is just incredible. It also focuses on evented IO, which when it first came out was very revolutionary and has really brought the idea of non-blocking evented IO into the mainstream. Personally, I just use Node a lot. It's worked really well for a lot of the projects and being able to work in the same language everywhere is very productive. But Node is not perfect. For one thing, Node has its own APIs, which are different than what you might be familiar with when you're working on the web. It also uses CommonJS instead of ES modules, which are the standard used by browsers now. To be fair, when Node was first started, this wasn't a thing, but it definitely affects productivity and makes things more complicated. Also security. Quite frankly, when Node was built, security was not at the forefront in terms of its design goals, and therefore you can build secure apps in Node but it requires on other platforms. Another thing is promises. When Node was started, this API did not exist in browsers, so it went its own way using callbacks and conventions for error handling and things like that. Unfortunately, JavaScript has moved forward, and though a lot of the Node APIs have begun to embrace and use promises, there's still many that don't. Another issue is the package.json file. When it originally started, this mainly contained information describing how one package related to others, but over time it's become a mono repo where you store all of the information about your project and tools that you might be using, um, scripts you might be running, many things related to it, uh, and it can make managing and maintaining uh, package.json more complicated. Another issue, and this one's a bit more subtle, is the, the package management is centralized on NPM. This isn't a problem until you're deploying an app and NPM goes down or has stability issues, or given that ownership has changed over time, potentially there might be a future owner which you don't want to do business with. Also, who can forget Node modules? You might have seen this meme out there, but anyone who's worked with Node is familiar with the Node modules folder and how big it can get and how long it can take to create on every project. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, here is Ryan Dahl back in 2018 talking about some of the things that he would do differently if he was doing Node again. And the funny thing is he is. So he a few years ago started a new project called Dino um, where you can see they've actually rearranged the letters in the word Node to come up with Dino. And according to their website, Dino is a simple, modern, and secure runtime for JavaScript and TypeScript that uses V8 and it's built in Rust. So what does that mean? Well, Dino is secure by default, has a single executable that you use for everything. It integrates TypeScript out of the box, so there's no compile tool chain you have to set up. Web APIs are always used first, and they work with browsers to standardize new APIs before considering making proprietary ones. It, standard library is fully reviewed and audited uh, as of version one. And you can import modules using the same system of ES modules that you use in the browser. Dino also includes a thoughtful tool chain out of the box for common tasks like linting, formatting, documenting, and testing your code. Under the hood, uh, you can see the setup is basically a small chunk of C++ code called the Dino that wraps V8. All of that is then uh, contained within a Dino process written in Rust. And there's a Dino isolate, which communicates with the Dino 
um, over a buffer to isolate it and um, protect it from memory issues and things like that. As well, all of the ops come in and out as messages to the Dino isolate uh, using something called Tokyo, which is a non-blocking IO library, also written in Rust. Uh, and all of the system level drivers themselves, again, written in Rust. So before we get too carried away, I'd really like to just mention why I think Dino is here to stay and worthwhile considering for your projects. The first one is that these days with uh, functions as a service and applications handling critical personal and private data, security is basically table states for any modern platform. Also, the TypeScript support in Dino is very handy. It comes out of the box pre-configured and it's supported at the runtime level. So you'll see things like stack traces and stuff like that will export in TypeScript rather than compiled JavaScript, which can be huge for productivity. Uh, there's also no node modules folder, which is fantastic. Using the same caching algorithms that your browser uses, whenever something is imported, it's cached at the system level and available to any application or script running it from Dino. This also means that things like running applications offline is supported once you um, run them once and cached everything that you need. Finally, it's backwards compatible with most NPM packages. This is a feature that wasn't there from the start, but over time has improved considerably. And now for the last you know, eight months to a year, whenever you import a node package, it seems to just work. And I've not had problems managing things like that. Uh, another big thing is that it uses the existing web APIs. These are stable, supported, and used by devs already. And so what that means is that you already know them and doesn't require any extra effort. It's also an opinionated tool chain. That's something that not everyone will, will agree with if you don't agree with what they've selected. But having an opinion out of the box, similar to how Rust and Go works, means that you can pick up a Dino project and start working right, right away, knowing that you'll be using the same tool chain and settings as your colleagues and people from other projects. I'd also like to point out that community interest is building steeply in Dino. We've seen companies like Amazon, GitHub, Microsoft, uh, Vercel, Jump on Board. And over the last year now, we have almost 2,700 public repos tagged with Dino. So that's a huge leap over the last uh, few years and definitely some momentum that I think is worth considering. All right, so we're gonna dive into a quick demo. All of this code was recorded here on my local box, but because uh, I don't want anything to go wrong, I've just taken screenshots. If you'd like me to run it, please leave a comment or contact me and I'd be happy to walk you through it. Installing Dino is quick and easy. You can just run a simple shell script that will install it on Mac OS or Linux, and there's an equivalent PowerShell script that you can use to install it on Windows. Because it comes out of the Firefox project um, and is built with Rust, you'll see that Dino works basically anywhere that Firefox and Rust support. So running things is simple. Uh, once you've installed it, you'll have a Dino executable on your path and there's commands for many common activities. The one we'll use here is dino run. And to execute it, you simply pass in the URL of the script that you'd like to run that can be local on your computer or remote on the internet. Uh, as in this case, we're actually running directly from the dino line website. So when we run it, the first thing it does is goes and checks the cache for the welcome script. And once it's done that, it executes it. In this case, simply printing the message, welcome to dino. Pretty cool, pretty simple and surprisingly fast. Looking at a bit more complicated code, here uh, we'll save this locally in a file called fetch.ts, and you can see a couple things. We're accessing some proprietary APIs that can connect to the environment using a Dino global, in this case to access the arguments that we're gonna pass into our script here to retrieve the URL. And we're also using dino.standardout to write to the, the console. So, when we run this, we're also using the native fetch API. So note that this doesn't have to be polyfilled and use the same API that you'll see in browsers already. And we can use async await because it's promise uh, based. All right, so let's run that. Uh, so we run fetch.ts, 
pass in the URL that we want to access, in this case, example.com, and boom, things explode. So what we're seeing here is Dino's permission system in work. Uh, what it's done is actually denied us access to the network at all because we haven't explicitly allowed that. So out of the box, Dino scripts are extremely limited. Uh, they have no access to the file system, the network, and they have to be allowed using flags that you pass in when you run it. So if we try that again, in this case, we'll allow network access, but scope it explicitly to example.com. When we run this, as you would expect, it'll retrieve the HTML and we're going to catenate that just because we don't need to see everything, but you should get the idea here. Diving into those permissions a little more, you'll see that by default, there's no file system access, no network access, no ex access to the environment or things that could be used to fingerprint the environment. So that includes things like high resolution clocks uh, and other hardware details. All of those have to be granted using allow flags and they're broken down into the different permissions that you might need. There's also a programmatic way for uh, scripts to access and request permissions. So you can request uh, permissions using a little descriptor that would include things like the scope and the permission you're asking for. Once you've done that and completed the work, it's common practice uh, to go and then revoke the permission after you've finished. So if you're reading a file or something like that, that you don't necessarily know in advance which one you'll need access to, you can request it, but then it's good form after you've gotten the data from it to revoke that. Reason being is that when you're building a complex project, you might import scripts that haven't been fully audited. And if that's the case, reducing your permissions can prevent unwanted behaviors. To be honest, having to use all these flags does get a little annoying. So what you'll typically see is most projects making use of some other script. So things like make files, PowerShell scripts to build and run with the appropriate flags. Once you get used to it, it's actually pretty simple and uh, not really a bother, but it is something to be aware of. Besides fetch, Dino implements many of the web, web APIs. And one of the cool things is that as of six months ago, this is all integrated with MDN. So what that means is when you look at the compatibility table in MDN or caniuse.com, you'll actually see which APIs are available and you can search MDN specifically for Dino APIs that you'd like to use. Some of the examples here are things like broadcast channels. It supports all the console uh, for debugging, web sockets, web workers, web storage. They've recently added support for URL patterns and crypto performance. There's many different APIs, but almost all of them come from the browser, which is uh, really great. A lot less to learn, which can be nice. There is a standard library which provides additional features. So there's more advanced date and time processing, though there's interest in moving to those once they are standardized as part of the web platform. There's more advanced formatting. There's a high performance web server with both native bindings that make use of REST, uh, as well as a more portable implementation. There's the permission API, like I said, there's TCP IP servers. Uh, and the other cool thing is that all of this is actually written in TypeScript and accessible on GitHub and the Dino website. So if you're looking to learn TypeScript, it's a great example of modern professional TypeScript uh, in a large code base. And it's also something that you can go and look at the source to see what's happening or file bugs and submit pull requests. You'll see that over time, the standard library is growing and maturing. Right now, they've officially hit V1. So all of the stable APIs, they're committing to keep the same way and you can use them out of the box, but there's always ongoing work and new things being brought in. These are potentially unstable. And so to use them, they have an unstable flag that you add to your scripts. A few years ago, this would be used almost all of the time. But now I would say it's the opposite. And unless you're doing something really cutting edge using newer unstable APIs, most of the time you won't need to use this flag. But it is good to be aware of. You might notice some dependencies will sometimes ask you to include that. The tool chain itself is really simple and accessible. It's all just provided as commands to the Dino executable. So this includes things like formatting, linting, testing, using a test suite similar to what you might see with Jest. We're not gonna dive into that right now, but it could be the topic of a future talk. I did have one caveat here, and I found often when I'm working, especially in transitional code bases, I'll have times when my entire code base 
has not been adjusted to meet the formatting and linting requirements of Dino. Uh, and especially if I'm working with third party libraries that I don't control, but have to include in my project. In these cases, there's an ignore flag that you can pass in and it will go and explicitly ignore either files or folders or patterns that you specify. Another common issue with larger projects is managing your dependencies. For small one-off scripts, it can be enough to import directly from a URL. However, as you begin to have multiple files using similar resources, what you'll see is that the imports can become very repetitive and you can also run into situations where you're importing two different versions of the same dependency. To solve this, the convention in the community has become to add a file called depths.tx. From there, you import everything you're going to use in your project and re-export it. Then in your files, you simply import from depths.ts and can be sure that your whole project will be using the same resources. Recently, browsers have been implementing a feature called import maps. This is a JSON file that describes how the imports in the browser should map to URLs. And it's something that Dino has adopted. So you'll see newer projects have also started to use import maps as well to improve compatibility between code running in Dino and code running in the browsers. This is already supported in Chrome Edge Opera and Rails 7 is going to be adopting it. Firefox is working on import maps and I wasn't able to find any clear signals for Safari. So if you know about import maps in Safari, I'd love to hear from you. To use your import maps, all you do is define the JSON file and then pass it in using the import map flag. From there, you'll be able to import directly from the spaces that you define, or the mapping, excuse me, you define in your import map. You're already starting to see uh, awesome around Dino. There's too many projects to list, but a few that I've found very inspiring are ALFJS. This was inspired by Next.js and supports hot module reloading, SSR, SSG, uh, without Webpack or bundling. Uh, it's a great way to use React in your code base, if you're, especially if you're interested in using TypeScript with React. It's smoking fast and so, so smooth and tight for the development cycle that uh, you, know, you can make changes. And it's really cool because they will scale uh, not with the size of your project, but um, you know, they'll remain a fixed linear time just based on the number of imports on a page. So it's really, really cool to see, even for large projects with complex dependency trees, that it can maintain that speed, unlike projects like Webpack, where as your project and your bundle size increases, the time for changes to show up on your app can really start to slow down. Ultra.js is similar. Uh, it is using some of the newer APIs to support things like React streaming for the quickest uh, time to first byte, I think it is, um, for rendering and uh, getting pages up really quickly. So if performance is an issue, Ultra.js is something that's new and maybe something to keep an eye on. It's also a great way to start looking at the new React streaming APIs. Finally, Oak is a middleware framework inspired by Koa. It, uh, is probably one of the more mature Dino frameworks and one that you'll see a lot of projects you use in place of Express when working with Dino. It has a ton of middleware that you can use for just about any feature that you would want in a modern web server, but it is purely focused on the HTTP layer. Just a reminder that if you have questions, I'm always happy to take them on the Dev Edmonton Slack uh, at Mark Bennett on Twitter or in the comments on this video. Thanks. Let's move on to a demo of ALEF. So installing ALEF is pretty simple. There is a Dino script that they have in the repository that you can use to install it. The dash A will temporarily grant it all privileges. So if you're concerned about that, I would recommend downloading it and taking a look to see exactly what it's doing. But essentially what it does is downloads the latest version of ALEF and installs the CLI as uh, something in your path that you can then run with the ALEF command. I've truncated the output here, but we'll take a look at what it actually does in a moment. So like many packages now, there's an init command that will go and create a new project for you. So in this case, we're creating a new project named enter the Dino. We're going to use VS Code and deploy to Vercel. It'll take a moment, it downloads it, creates a new directory with everything set up for you. 
And once you change into that, there's a couple commands we'll be interested in. Alef dev is similar to what people using Webpack dev might see, where it searches a development server where a change is made or automatically and immediately reflected. There's also start. This is a little different. And so you use this for server-side rendering when running in production on something like Vercel or a similar service. If you're not pre-rendering your site, this is what you'll actually want to use to make sure that routing is being passed to the correct pages. And finally, if you want to pre-render some components using static site generation, then use alef build to render the pieces that you've configured for static generation in advance and would deploy that to your CDN. So we'll take a quick look at what this actually looks like. So we change into the directory that is made and run alef dev to start our dev server. So this is where it gets really impressive because once it starts up, you'll see that in the browser, you can go and make a change. And without those build steps, it's almost instantaneous how it's reflected in the browser. So I've got a quick video recording to show what that looks like. So you can see here, I'm editing it. I'm changing the text and I'll hit save. And on the right, as soon as I hit save, it re-renders immediately. And what you can see there is that the server on the left didn't have to do any rebundling or repackaging, anything like that. So we'll watch it one more time. So finish, hit save, and there you go. Right away, it's updated. So you might have seen similar with Webpack and it's definitely possible, but what you'll see is unlike Webpack, this will scale and the time that it takes to do that refresh will not get larger as the size of your project increases. So a few other things to wrap up here. I just wanted to mention that Dino loves WebAssembly and what that means is that many of even the native packages will use WebAssembly for cross-platform performance and it's very easy to write WebAssembly modules and include them in your Dino projects. So it's great for interfacing with Rust code or with code in C++, things like that. You'll also be able to publish Dino modules transparently to NPM, which means that people using them on NPM won't even be aware that they're using Dino. So this is great, especially on teams where you're perhaps transitioning parts of your code base to Dino and want to maintain compatibility with existing node projects. Finally, one of the really cool magical things is the Dino compile command. This will actually take a script and build a single executable that includes the Dino runtime, the script you're running, and all of its dependencies in a file that you can then deploy cross-platform to Windows, Mac, or Linux. It's a really cool way to package up and distribute commands. Dino deploy is also a new feature coming out that provides a function as a service platform globally distributed in I think 28 data centers where you can deploy Dino functions quickly and easily. So it seems like this might be a new source of revenue to uh, fund the core team, which is remaining obviously open source, but this is very new. So I'm not really sure how it's going to progress. If you can get into the alpha, you'll actually find too that the hosting on it is free. So a good time to check that out. I'd like to wrap by acknowledging the work of Ryan Dahl. Uh, he's done amazing work with Node and the Node community and has now shifted his focus to Dino where he seems to be doing a really good job of stewarding the community there and being aware of some of the issues that came up with Node and working hard to prevent those from happening with Dino and just building a thoughtful, well-structured platform for the future. If you haven't, he had a really good interview about six months ago on the Changelog podcast that I highly recommend checking out. I'd also like to thank Luca Casanto for answering a couple of my questions that I had on GitHub and, and on Discord. And I'd also like to directly thank the Dino Discord community for being so awesome and welcoming and giving me so many good suggestions for this talk. If you're interested in getting started, uh, I encourage you to check out the Dino website. Uh, also, there's an excellent manual that the community's put together that's linked from there, uh, which is a good way to get started if you're looking to kick the tires. Uh, the Discord community, like I said, very welcoming, very friendly, also linked to from the website, and Stack Overflow. To wrap up, I'd just like to make a quick pitch for um, any junior devs that are looking for work. Uh, I've been very interested in helping junior devs, and I'm looking at how I can get more involved in this space. So if you are someone who has experience mentoring or onboarding juniors and want to share how that's gone, good or bad, or if you're a junior who had a great experience uh, and would like to share how your interview and onboarding went and um, maybe some best practices that I can share with the community, I would really like to talk to you. Again, you can find me Mark Bennett on Twitter 
or mark on the dev Edmonton Slack or leave a comment on this video. Thank you.